I am very happy to be back here. And just think, I mean, we had to miss last summer, so it is very nice to actually see you in person uh, and to be together in this particular way. I've been looking forward uh, to it for some time. Uh, that is, until I heard Daniel last night, uh, because I had a big plan here uh, today. Uh, the whole thing was going to be laid out uh, with mystery and intrigue uh, and uh, a slowly building uh, climax uh, to the denouement when I would finally give you the absolution of your sin. <laughs> but he told you uh, what the ending was. Uh, I have no idea how he knew this. Uh, how, how could he figure this out? Am I that transparent? Is it that clear? Are my students right uh, who say, Dr. Paulson, the one-trick pony? Is that, I mean, is that really the way that uh, works out? My teacher, Gerhard Ferdi, used to be referred to as so narrow that when he turned for profile, he would disappear. Uh, so, I mean, uh, apparently this has been handed down in this way. So, I have to be ready for this in another kind of way, and uh, therefore, I might as well just start with a series of absolutions for you, uh, not try the mystery, not try to build up uh, for this. And I just got a, a cup, it was a great cup from one of my students, it says, I'm with Paul. Uh, it could be Paul's son as well, but I'm, I'm with Paul. I took it exactly the way this was meant. And for that reason, I would actually like to greet you the way Paul greets you, and only Paul could do this. You have died. There is Paul's greeting. What a great greeting. Uh, and you're supposed to say liturgically, and also have you. <laughs> Then we can proceed in freedom because, listen, I have just freed you in a way that you could not believe because I have now taken away from you the responsibility of preserving your life. I have saved you a lot of time and a lot of effort since all of this is already behind you and we can get on to other things which are truly free. And in that way, then we can understand what Paul is actually saying here. There are a whole set of other absolutions, and since we haven't seen each other for about two years, I feel you ought to get them right up front. I'm going to absolve you from trying to save the planet. That one, uh, you're free from. Uh, this one, you don't need to continue in any way, shape, or form. By the way, I'm also going to completely and fully absolve you uh, from ever trying to make the world a better place. Uh, this one also is not going to be taken off your shoulders. You don't need to worry about that one at all. Then, finally, I can get to the topic for today, which I love and uh, I don't know who dreamed this up, but this is exactly right. Assurance of faith, or what we usually call simply certainty. And so I want now to take up this particular matter and identify how it is that our Christ absolves you, frees you, forgives you into certainty, which otherwise you do not have. I mean, you've heard uh, a good deal about this. So our topic, topic is exactly right. And then furthermore, I had Caleb whisper in my ear, as he usually does, that he specifically wants this, that Christ is the only sinner. Now, how does that happen? I mean, how do you actually say something like this? And of course... Uh, Caleb whispers it in my ear because he wants me to get in trouble. Uh, this, is, this has got me in trouble all over the world. And every time it comes up, it got Luther in trouble. It got Jesus Christ in trouble, as we're going to see in a couple of moments. The Christ, the only sinner, is always going to get you in trouble. And when I listen, listen to Cable, uh, Caleb, things go bad. In fact, uh, this, my whole life has changed. I've uh, been out speaking for years, and uh, of course, it's always uh, as a lone wolf. Now, whenever I get up and speak, everybody says, Where, where's Caleb? Where, where's Caleb? Uh, he should be along, uh, because otherwise, I mean, how are we going to understand you? Uh, how are we going to know... <laughs> How are we going to know what's said next? And most of all, how are we going to know that Melanchthon taught Luther that? I mean, how, how, how will we know that? 
Uh, and uh, so Caleb is uh, always there with me. He's given me my topic, my specific topic, Christ. I mean, how is it that we become certain what well, Christ is the only sinner? That's how. Now, of course, uh, here I want to start taking up what this actually means in your life because when we take up certainty, when t- we take up what is sure or assurance, you have to notice immediately in your own life and everybody else around you, there is not much assurance going on. There is a great deal of uncertainty. In fact, you'll see it in its primary form, and it's just busting out all over the place now in panic and anxiety. Panic is all over. Uh, And how you actually address a person in panic is truly difficult. And of course, all of us are quickly falling into this in such a way as as to say, "I, I just had a panic attack. The panic just came to me. I have no idea how it happened or how I'm going to get rid of it. And anxiety is the same sort of way. And believe me, you've already heard in, uh, in our sermon this morning that this has been with us for a long time. This issue of how you deal with panic and anxiety comes up over and over again. One of the chief of them is Calvin, who otherwise followed Augustine to a T, except on this matter of certainty where he finally decided he had to break with him because he could not get out of his anxiety. And by the way, uh, Luther himself knew that the scholastic teachers that came before him, the medieval teachers, were all looking for this a big prize of certainty, and they thought they could find it in something called a syllogism. How do you like that? (laughs) They thought they could actually get it in a logical syllogism by which they could deduce from sure principles what it is finally that we can say about ourselves and what we can finally be sure about ourselves. In comes Luther and says there is nothing worse than uncertainty. This is the greatest plague on humanity. And when you have it, it sticks in such a way that you cannot find a way out. So now we have to see how this way out is made and how it comes finally through Christ the only sinner. And for this, we have to note where certainty comes up for the first time in Scripture. And the first place that it comes up, of course, is the very first place. It's in Genesis. And you can say, well, it's not in Genesis 1. Well, it's in Genesis 2. And in Genesis 2, now you have two references to certainty or surety. One of them that specifically uses the word, and that is when God gives Adam and Eve two trees, not one, and he puts a different word in each one of the trees. And then he says... uh, Uh, regarding the trees, including the tree of life, you may eat. You may eat from all the trees. This is called a promise, and it is a great promise given to Adam and Eve. Then it is followed immediately with the word certainty or surety. But there it comes in the other tree, because the other tree is the knowledge of good and evil. And there God says to Adam and Eve, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for if you eat of it you shall surely die. (laughs) And there's your certainty. Of course, in comes the serpent right away in Genesis 3, and what does he do? He's going to take on the certainty of the promise, which is the origin of the promise. Did God really say that you may eat of all of the trees? And then secondly, he goes right after the threat in the law. And he says, I'm going to tell you something. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not surely die. (laughs) And now we've got our Shirley's fighting one another. (laughs) Well, this is the, what, what, what happens in the Garden of Eden. And now you've got uh, what Augustine calls a fall. And now we can come back and identify how it is that we are going to read all of Scripture. What we mean by telling the story that finally gives you certainty. The story of 
all scripture, which is the story of Christ, and how you actually teach this now is going to be crucial. Because what we're looking for here is a very specific certainty. This is not general certainty. Not general certainty that people otherwise look for, uh, like a rooster has who is walking out in front of the hen house. We call this cocksure. <laughs> now, many of you don't even know what a chicken coop is. You have no idea what a hen is. You have no idea what sort of certainty this is. That's general certainty. And he thinks he knows uh, what he controls and what he's got, but he really doesn't have uh, a, a basis for this at all. And for those of you who are urban, who don't understand that at all, what we're talking about is a person who does the pimp walk. This is a person who has general surety, but they do not have a foundation on which to do it. And don't make me do the pimp walk uh, for you. <laughs> So this is general surety, people who think they've got it, who think they know, who think uh, they actually understand how it is that they have power and authority and they're sure, but they are certainly not sure. And by the way, uh, when you do not have this general surety, then you go off looking like the rest of the world does to make uncertainty a virtue. So you say, well, if I can't be certain, if I can't be cocksure of something, if I can't strut my stuff and I don't feel that confident, then what I'm gonna do is take uncertainty and I'm gonna make it into a virtue. By the way, this has a name. It's called the evolutionary survival mechanism. How do you like that? <laughs> this means that in order for you to survive, you have to be like a rabbit who's going out and the ears are turning every which way because somebody may attack you from any side at any particular moment. And if you do not have your ears going and you are ready, you yourself will not survive. And therefore, uh, uh, uncertainty is a virtue. That's what's going to keep the rabbit alive. And by the way, this is why the world has become populated by paranoid schizophrenics who are constantly worried, constantly afraid. And uh, if, uh, if there is even one bit of truth in this nonsense, then it is this idea somehow that you are going to manage to hold on to your life by being constantly aware and ready to fight any enemy at a moment's notice. But that means that you are going to be living in uncertainty the rest of your life. Now, uh, I uh, am just about to embark on something that I rarely do, but uh, Daniel wouldn't do it. Uh, it's culture. So I'm going to give you a little culture now. Uh, and uh, the, if we had the Zoll brothers from uh, the Mockingbird group over here, they would be doing it. Uh, but we don't have them right here, uh, right now, so I'm going to give you a little bit of culture. And uh, I also understand every time that I try to do this, my students start to laugh, and they are not laughing with me. <laughs> they are laughing at me. But I actually found a place out in what we call culture that is called ideas.ted. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make this kind of thing up. Ideas.ted. Now, why, why can't I get a TED Talk? I mean, what, what is the problem with this? I mean, I'm the doctor of love, and... Uh, uh, I know all about grace and so on. Why, why do I never get a TED Talk? But this particular place, you can go find it. Uh, it's out there. I don't know where, where it is, but you'll find it. And uh, there, ideas.ted grabs up all the TED Talks and then tries to lay them out in uh, five points. And in this particular one, uh, the uh, question was raised, how do we navigate uncertainty in life? So here goes ideas.ted the five top ways to navigate uncertainty in life. Number one, the only thing that is certain is uncertainty. Well, that was a, that you've, that, you could see that one coming in. But there, uh, she says, give in. Just give in. Secondly, the only sure thing, now she's saying exactly the opposite of what she just said. There was no sure thing. Anyway, the only sure thing is you. <laughs> oh, I love this. 
Then she says, invest in yourself. Boy, I, you know, Wall Street is waiting for that. Uh, <laughs> invest in yourself. Okay, now here's number three. So, in the meantime, while you're investing in yourself and trying to see what you're going to gain from that, comfort yourself. <laughs> now, I'm not touching this one. Uh, <laughs> you, you people are already apparently experts. I do not uh, need to help you in that regard at all. Then she says, number four, however, don't believe everything you think. Oh, that, that's good. <laughs> don't believe everything you think. Oh, that is good. Uh, Apparently, some things you can, uh, you, can, you can think and believe, but you, have, you can't believe them all, uh, and uh, just watch out. So we're going to have to come back to, to that one, because that one's got some promise. Now, number five. Stop looking for someone to rescue you. <laughs> then she says, no one is coming. <laughs> oh, I love this. Uh, you got to get over that. Look, I, I, uh, I just did a sermon for the wife of my dear teacher, Gerhard Ferdy. And she loved a sermon from her husband, Gerhard Ferdy, which was only one paragraph long. And I preached this uh, at her funeral. And it's on Psalm 130. And what do you suppose David is saying there? David is not saying, no one is coming. <laughs> David says... I wait upon the Lord. My soul waits upon the Lord. In hope, I cling to his word. It was beautiful. <laughs> and then you say, well, what word? What, what word is, is, is clingable, is, is worth clinging to, and can be clung to? What word is that? And David said it just above this. He said, there is forgiveness with you, that thou mayest be feared. <laughs> Gerard Ferdy in his sermon stopped and said, now isn't this odd? What is so fearful about forgiveness? Why is it that when forgiveness is there, everybody is afraid of it? How does that happen? Uh, and what is the fear there? It's because of the specific certainty that we are going to find here and we will learn that, know that. There's a specific certainty that you have. And uh, this certainty means there are all kinds of other things you won't know. You can say, I don't know much about history. I don't know much about biology. But I do know one and one is two. And now what we want to do is get to this specific certainty. What is the thing in which the certainty is found? And how does that happen when forgiveness is so fearful to people? How does it happen? And for this, we actually now have to sit down and think about the whole story of Scripture. What is going on in all of the Bible? How God is not only telling a story, but he's giving you the thing that is certain. And with that, you actually have to know how this comes about. You can't read it like Pelagius did which was to say that in the beginning you were made a little child and then with discipline and discipleship you'd follow Christ and become an adult and in that way you would now be certain and sure that's the way of progress. That is Pelagius and it's dead wrong. In comes Augustine, and Augustine says, no, that's not the way we read Scripture. You begin as a little seed, and then you grow through discipline into your final end. Instead, you begin as God's good creation and then have a mighty fall. And here he says, it's creation and fall. But to this now, we have to note something much more specific than this. This is why we as Lutherans are Augustinian, but with a lemon twist. <laughs> and the lemon twist now is going to come right at this point, so that in all of Scripture now, you're going to learn what to look for, hear, read, know, and say, and it's going to be three words. 
The three words are law, sin, and salvation. Now, uh, I've got Caleb in my ear again. Caleb tells me, aha, that was exactly the way Melanchthon put it in his first loci. Uh, so he must have taught it to Luther. Well, f- uh, well, fine, all right? But what we want to do now is note what we mean by these three words, law, sin, and salvation. This does not mean uh, that I'm going to begin with the goodness of creation and watch it unfold into its beauty, nor do we say that the fall is so great, you are non posa, non pecare, not able not to sin, and then we somehow have to figure out how to move you into the new kingdom where you are not able not to sin. And in this way now, uh, all of Scripture gets read through the primary lens of saying the most important thing in Scripture is the Exodus, or the most important thing is Sinai, or the most important thing is the series of covenants. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had to talk to people about this. It's the covenants, they tell me. It's one covenant after another. Noah's got a covenant. Um, Abraham's got a covenant. And it's one covenant after another. And all of Scripture, then, is the laying out of these covenants. Well, I'm covenant to death. And uh, now what I want to do is identify what that center actually is. And by the way, the center is not even Pentecost. Well, what is it? Now... Uh, I don't want Chad Burt to get too excited here. He may take flight. This is Isaiah 53. And if you didn't know, that's in the Old Testament. Uh, It's Isaiah 53. And uh, Luther himself starts to lay this out so that it becomes clear. Sorry. Um, And it is one sentence that we want in particular, although it would be wonderful to take up the whole chapter. Here's the sentence. God has laid the iniquity of us all on him. There is the center of scripture. And this is going to be the place of your certainty. God has laid the iniquity of us all on him. There's a great verb, and the verb is in the past sense, has laid. And the uh, subject of the verb is God, not you. And then furthermore, we have a direct object, the iniquity of us, that's us. Then uh, it says, on him, and that's where we want to start going. How does this happen? How is it that the iniquity of us gets on him? And then what happens when that happens? Because that is going to be the place of your certainty. That will be the place of grasping. That will be the place of holding. And that will be the place finally where first you'll be afraid of forgiveness. And then you'll say, oh, let it pour. Let it, let it come. Because now I actually want to hear how this is laid out for me. So that for once in my life, I will not any longer be anxious and panic filled. But I will hear precisely what Christ is saying to me and why. And by the way, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 6 now, is the basis, of course, for these two central places in all of Scripture. They now simply borrow, or shall I say, steal from Isaiah 53. This is the word, this is the prophecy. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The one who knew no sin became sin. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. He became a curse for us. Now when you've got these two, now you're knocking on the door of what it means to actually have certainty. But for this, we have to figure out how Christ is going to deliver this to us. And we have a number of places that we could go for this. One is Luther's small catechism. We often do that. And of course, I'd love to sit here and say, this is what it means to say, he has redeemed me. Then it says, at great cost, not to you, but to him. What kind of cost? Not with silver and gold, but with his holy and precious blood and innocent suffering and death. Now let's unpack that. But the way to do it, I'm sorry, I'm moving this around too much. 
The way to do this uh, could also be Luther's Greater Galatians commentary, you know, especially, not only, but especially in the third chapter. You could do that. And if you wanted to do that, then I want, to get, want you to get Camacho's translation, which just happens to be published by 1517, and I want all of you to go get it and read it so that you can hear what is being said right here in Luther's own words at a moment where he was absolutely brilliant as a teacher handing this over to his students. But today, what I want to do is take up another place with it. It is Matthew 3, the baptism of Jesus. And with that, we can actually start hearing what it means to say that Jesus is the only sinner. How does that happen? How how is that uh, going to be good news for anybody? Uh, Not only me, but for him, and what it means then for all people. And for this reason, now we have to go to John's baptism. Luther has a series of wonderful sermons on this, and uh, they have been fairly recently translated into English, so you can find this in Luther's works as well. What we're looking for here is what uh, John's baptism means. So John the Baptist is in the wilderness. Uh, He's been eating locusts, little wild honey, In he comes, and now uh, he is going to baptize. And this is John's baptism. Well, what is it? For uh, years, thousands of years, Christians were trying to say there's something to John's baptism that is different than Jesus' baptism. And it took Luther to finally come in and say, no, that is not true at all. In fact, John's baptism is repentance for forgiveness. That's what it is. And repentance for forgiveness of sin now means these three words. You have to know law, sin, and salvation. When you know these three words, then you can understand what repentance is, what forgiveness is, and what sin is. Then we can identify exactly what Luther does to say uh, this is the beginning of his revolutionary moment, but it didn't come to full fruition until later. We're called 1517 for a reason because in 1517, Luther went to Matthew 3, this sa- or Matthew 4, excuse me, this nearly the same place and tried to identify what it, mean when Je- what it meant when Jesus said, um, repent, right? Uh, do penance or repent. Now in comes Luther and Luther says, It's not even do penance or repent. It is be transformed just the way that Paul puts this in his own letters. And now uh, we can understand that there is not one thing about repentance, but there are two. Because we learn law, sin, and salvation. What are the two? First, repentance means I believe God's law is accusing me. That's what repentance is. That's the first thing of repentance. I believe right now God's law is accusing me. I hear it. I feel it. I I know it. I believe God's law is accusing me. Second, don't despair. Seek help. Now, you know my little uh, TED talker says, give up. There's nobody coming. Uh, uh, whatever you're waiting for is not going to show up. And here in repentance, we know don't despair, seek help, but you have to know where to seek help. This is Paul in Romans 2, 4. Don't you know the free gift of the Lord leads to repentance? Now, that for that, you have to know what sin is. And knowing what sin is, it's, it's difficult. First of all, uh, we often think it's a debt, and it is. So we, we say, uh, forgive us our debts. Yes. We also know that frequently in Scripture, it's referred to as a weight, uh, heaviness, a weight. And uh, we find this, for example, uh, ex- example in Hebrew tw- Hebrews 12. But the primary thing that Luther uh, zooms in on is that sin is a voice. And the voice of sin is accusing you. It starts as a threat and then it moves to an actual accusation. And Paul in Romans 2.15 says, this is what happens in the conscience. 
When you are under the accusation of the law, you move between accusation and excusing. Accusing, excusing. Accusing, excusing. And that's the rest of your life. And this life is not certain. It's the exact opposite. And it's moving between these. Now, whose voice is it? Well, Jesus says this very clearly. John 5, don't think I will accuse you. There is only one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you have put your trust. So Jesus came one day to be baptized by John. By the way, am I done? Is this it? Keep it going. No, no, all right. Well, I got to go fast then. Jesus shows up. He shows up and uh, uh, instead of baptizing John, he says to John, baptize me. And John, you have to read this in the King James Version, forbade him. <laughs> Accused him. He forbade him. This is a just, I'm not, this is, uh, uh, I, I do not want to hear what you just said. I am closing my ears. You, uh, and whatever you just said, I'm saying, la, 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 la. I'm not going to listen to that because what you just said really scared me. Because John himself knew he had a baptism for, the, for, the, for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. But he thought the forgiveness of sins was purgation, cleaning out by the law. And he thought that when the Messiah arrived, the first thing the Messiah would say, say was, John, good job, you set it all up and now I'm coming in uh, and I'm going to burn the place down. And it is going to be by fire. And John says, it's got to be by fire. That's the only way to do it. And then Jesus now says, no, John, I am not asking to baptize. I am asking to be baptized. John forbade him. And then Jesus looked at John and said, suffer it. <laughs> that means suck it up. Be a man. I know you're afraid of uh, what's going to happen here because what's going to happen is actual forgiveness of sins and you're going to see how it's going to actually happen and it's going to scare the bejesus out of you. And in this particular way, he says, suffer it. That is, do it to me. Then uh, it says, John suffered it. <laughs> he did it, which now means that Christ is no longer simply a sufferer. He is now the sinner. There is a difference between the sufferer and the sinner. And that's what John did not want to happen to his Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, he's an innocent man, but you do the math. Repentance means I am a sinner. How do I know I'm a sinner? I hear the voice of the law accusing me. So Christ is not just to us a sinner, Luther says, but to himself he's a sinner. Jesus is not just a sin wearer. He's not just coating himself with sin. Luther, but why does he come to be baptized, seeing that no sin or impurity is on him for the baptism to take away? What a holy cow baptism that must have been. Uh, then that's a literal translation uh, from they were afraid to put that in but anyway it was it's a holy cow baptism that must be here John gets a sinner who has no sin for he is uh, he is no sin in his own person yet he is der größte Sinder the greatest sinner who has has and bears the sin of the world now how did he get them how did that happen? Jesus now steps in to my person. This is what we call my space. He's stepping into my space. He steps into my person and he stands where we all stand who are sinners. And Luther says it very specifically, Christ now comes into my person. How close? So close now that he takes what is mine and makes his own. Uh, you'll say, it's getting kind of crowded in here, Jesus. Uh, 
I mean, uh, I, I kind of filled the whole thing before. Now you come in, uh, in my person, and uh, uh, now, uh, how, how do I have to speak of you and of me? Listen, the first thing Jesus does when he has taken over the person is he takes over the person of David and he steals all David's psalms. So none of the psalms, David was very careful, he wrote them all down, he had nice little tunes, uh, he, had, he, had, he, had, uh, he had the rights to them. In comes Jesus, and he goes down all of the Psalms. Psalm 40, my sins have overtaken me. That's not David, that's Christ. Psalm 41, I have sinned against you. David uh, wrote it down, then Jesus stole it from him. Uh, then Psalm 69, your report, reproaches have fallen on me. Psalm 22, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they don't belong to David. They now belong to Jesus. Even Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who otherwise goes off the rails constantly, got this one particularly right. Uh, and he understood that Jesus came in and made David's Psalms his own. And the reason he did was that he is now in your person. How did he end up with my sins? They were laid on him, Isaiah 53, and he took them. He stole the sins of my person. He became me, the sinner. Then he became a great sinner, really great. But he didn't stop there. He became the greatest of all sinners. Then you know what he did? He became the only sinner. Now, what is the law supposed to be doing all this time? The law sits back and watches this. The law itself did not understand what it meant in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when, when it says uh, that Christ was born of a woman, born under the law. Well, here it is. Now, the law is watching this. The law had no idea that this could happen. In fact, the law thought it knew exactly what each person who each person was and what each person is, had, had done and could actually go in and identify the penalty that is deserved. Now he looks down and he can't see David anymore. He sees Christ. And more specifically, he looks down and he can't see sin anywhere else in the world. And it is all on Jesus Christ. Now what is the law supposed to do? The law has no free will. The law can't go back to God and say, could I... Uh, mix it up a little bit uh, and do, do a little something different? No. The law does what the law must. It accuses the sinner. And when it accuses him, it accuses Christ and only Christ. Now, when this happens, you remember that Christ has done all of this for your sake. Now, what he does when he takes your sin and the law accuses him, is takes it right to the cross. And as Peter says, he nails it all there, since you cannot do it. And there, when he nails your sins, and they are there on the cross once and for all, on the third day, Christ rose again. And you know what happened? The law went completely silent. It had nothing else to say and no one else to accuse. Nevertheless, Jesus said something. Jesus came to his own detractors, who, the, who had betrayed him and said, I forgive you all your sin. And when he did this, he not only could do it, he accomplished it, and he gave you his baptism so that you do not go through your own baptism, you go into his. He took your sin, he gave you his baptism. This is what Paul means in Romans chapter 6. Uh, when you have been baptized into a death like his, that is his death, his baptism, then you will surely be raised in a resurrection like his. And that is Christ's promise to you. This is the one certain thing. I'm uncertain about everything else in life, except I know this. Our preacher already gave this to us. Your faith given to you in Christ's baptism, not your own, means you shall be saved. Amen. Mm -hmm.